Hi, everyone. Um, welcome this evening. It's a beautiful night tonight. Glad you could join us. My name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Library, and I would like to um, thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this talk tonight. Um, the Friends of the Library uh, uh, arrange and, um, and sponsor most of the adult programming at the library. Um, and this, this series of art talks is one of those things. So thank you to the friends. Um, we are, uh, we have just arranged to have another art talk um, added. Uh, Jane has agreed to do another talk in October. Um, so we're excited about that. She'll be talking about John Singer Sargent in October. Um, there's a link in your, in the chat, if you'd like to see um, what the, talk, the, the other talks are about and um, if you'd like to register. I'll also send out that link in, a, in an email after the talk, so you don't have to um, interrupt your viewing right now. Um, so um, on September 29th, it will, it, the talk is about Edward Hopper, and on October 13th um, is John Singer Sargent. So we're excited about those, and we are delighted tonight to welcome Jane O'Neill of Culturally Curious um, to give another talk for us. Um, she, last month she spoke about, uh, about Norman Rockwell and his evolving views on race, which was a fascinating talk. Um, you can see the recording in the link that also has the registration and details of the other talk. Um, so uh, Jane got her master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard. Uh, she taught art history at the college level for a decade and has worked at several New England museums, including the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Courier Museum of Art. Um, so welcome, Jane, and I'm going to hand over the controls to you. Thank you so much, Sally. I'm so happy to be with everybody tonight, and thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to um, gather around your computers and um, and spend a little time looking at art and thinking about art and um, and, and enjoying some of the most beautiful images that were um, created in um, in the 19th century. So we're, we're going to have the pleasure of exploring Impressionist painting and one part of Impressionist painting that I have always been particularly interested in is, um, is their interest in, in cafe culture. I guess you could say I really, I, I love people watching and, and sort of the beginnings of, of Impressionism had included a lot of people watching. So before I, I get ahead of myself, I wanted to give you an overview in terms of the material that we're going to look at tonight and what there is to expect. So this will be about an hour long program. In our overview for this evening, I wanted to start off with an introduction to Impressionism. I know a lot of people that come to these programs, you're probably really familiar with Impressionism already, um, but I was giving a talk recently and I, I was using all these terms that I thought were, were pretty familiar to people and I got a lot of questions about them afterwards. So I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page with all of this. Then we'll turn our attention to why cafes? Why were Impressionist artists so interested in painting cafe culture in, in Paris and, and around France at this time? And, um, and I'll sort of, uh, we'll sort of dive into what that really meant, cafe culture, and think about the influence of the movement of realism. Then we'll turn our attention to the concept of the French flaneur, <laughs> um, which is a great term. And once you know it, you're going to see it everywhere in the art, in, in art that's created at this time. And so I'll be defining that for you. And we'll talk about a little bit about the feminist art historical concept of the male gaze, because you'll be seeing a lot of that too. And then we'll dive into some of the greats, Renoir, Degas, Manet, and, and look at how they depicted the world around them, um, particularly early on in their career, in their careers. Um, and then we'll finish up thinking about maybe why these artists turned away from painting cafes and the excitement of cafes uh, later on in their career, and then think about how kind of the next generation of artists kind of took up that mantle. So there's a lot to cover, but it's all great images and we should have a great time with this. Um, 
I will do my best to look at the chats as we go along, but sometimes I just get into the flow of things and it's a little bit hard to, um, to, to break that up. But if there's some good stopping points too along the way, I can pause and take questions. And then obviously at the end, any questions that you might have or comments, I definitely welcome either one. All right, so let's get started with just something that's absolutely gorgeous. This is just, this is almost like an August day in New England, isn't it? Isn't this just one of the most lovely paintings you can imagine? This is Monet's depiction of a poppy field, of a poppy field from 1873. And I think of this as a really sort of iconic image of Impressionism. This is sort of a great way to get started with it and to, um, and to understand the ins and outs of Impressionism. So when it comes to Impressionism, what we're talking about is light, bright colors. There's not a lot of black here, and uh, particularly as we get further along with Impressionism, many of the artists just um, uh, forego using black altogether. But we also see, very importantly, loose brushwork. All of these poppies, what, we, what our eyes and brains tell us are poppies in this field here, are just easily little dabs of color. I call this broken brushwork or broken brush strokes. Um, so you, we can sort of think of this as prior to Impressionism, artists were trying to create invisible brush strokes. They were trying to eliminate um, evidence of the artist's hand. And now with Impressionism, you have this radical movement where artists are just kind of working quickly. They're working um, in this kind of sketchy manner where, where their brush strokes are visible and, and, and precision and detail are not the goal, but instead um, just a loose approximation, a feeling uh, that, that, that evokes you know, a summer day like the one that we see here. So for the most part, Impressionism looks a lot like this. We have sort of small horizontally oriented landscapes and just, you know, faint suggestions of modern life, maybe upper class women, um, like the ones that we see here. So, um, so for the most part, uh, Impressionism is uh, landscape painting. And I think that's what most people think of when they think of Impressionism. And the reason for that is very simple. And I think this image here, which is by the, the French Impressionist master Renoir, I think that this image is, is like the best image to, talk, to use when thinking about why the French Impressionists love to paint outdoors. Because Renoir here has painted his friend Monet painting, also painting, in a garden. This is also from 1873. So we have the presence of two Impressionist masters in this painting. Um, Renoir as the artist himself and then uh, depicting another artist, Monet. So we have here this idea of painting outside, painting en plein air as the French called it. <laughs> and, um, and the reason they were doing that is because these artists were really interested in capturing the momentary effects of light and shadow. Uh, that was one of the greatest goals in their painting. So by necessity, they were taking all of their tools and materials outside. So you can see that the size of the canvas that Monet is painting on here is a, a rather sort of humbly sized um, canvas. And you can see that he's, you know, he's got a little box for his paints and he's got his palettes and his brushes. So, um, so tubes of paint had really just been invented around this time. Prior to this, you had artists who were, you know, mixing up their own pigments. Sometimes those pigment, pigments were um, contained in, in glass beakers. Sometimes they were contained in animal bladders. You can imagine that moving all of that would have been quite an undertaking, but now it was becoming easy. So, um, so Impressionism is, is producing this, this immediacy, this informality that the art world had never really known before because artists would go out and just paint for an afternoon and consider something like this, which again has this rough kind of sketchy brushwork. We can see evidence of, of the brushwork and the artist's hand throughout this picture. Uh, and they're doing this quickly. So, so we have this new way of sort of documenting the world. And, um, and it, it's sort of in defiance of the advent of photography. These are impressionist artists who are sort of turning their backs on photography in some ways and sort of saying, okay, 
um, painting needs kind of a new goal, a new challenge, because we do have this way of documenting the world now. And, um, and so what is the function of art? The function of art is no longer to create um, this perfect um, likeness of what we see, but to in, imbue it with something that is of the artist too. So, <laughs> so that's a lot to come out of a painting like this, but I wanted to sort of emphasize for you with, the, with these next two works by Monet, that these artists, all of these Impressionist artists were really interested in capturing light. And that's what we see here in these two works by Claude Monet. They both date to 1891. They're both depictions of haystacks. One, um, the one on the, I believe the one on the left is from a private collection and the one on the right is from the MFA in Boston. And I should mention, even though these are very simple compositions, Monet's haystacks have sold in the past, just the past few years, for anywhere from 80 to $110 million. These are highly sought after works and highly valued works. Um, so getting back to this idea of capturing light, for Monet, it didn't really matter what he was painting, what the subject was for the most part. He was really interested in how the play of light and shadow function off of any given object, whether it was a haystack or the facade of a church. Um, he would come back to it again and again and paint it at different times of the day in different um, sort of atmospheric conditions in different um, climates and temperatures. So, so he, was, he would stand before that same object again and again, squint his eye, and he wrote about, you know, I'm just looking for, you know, a, 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 the, the glimmer of yellow, I'm looking for peaches, I'm looking for these brighter colors that, that sort of bounce off the object that I'm actually painting. So the thing itself wasn't that important. And I think that's a, an important concept for us to keep in mind, particularly for Monet, who wasn't um, totally wedded to this idea of painting, um, everyday life, but he does have these, these gorgeous paintings like this, like the two that you have up here on the screen. Um, the one on the left is Water Lilies and the Japanese Bridge from 1897 to 1899. That's at the Princeton University Art Museum. And then I just love this one on the right. It's just so gorgeous. It's a depiction of his wife and son from 1875. And I brought in these two images again to sort of emphasize that light bright color palette, the broken brush strokes, but also that, um, that Monet was interested in capturing things that he could that he could see himself, that he could visibly witness. This is, this is a big concept and this is going to play into cafe culture too. So, um, so even though he's known for these landscapes, he would, he would, you know, for instance, go into his backyard where he constructed this water lily pond and, and paint that or paint his, um, his beloved family. But I love this comparison here. And, the, and, and after this comparison, we'll sort of turn our attention to realism and, and the idea of cafes too. So what we have here is a side-by-side -side comparison, and this is sort of a classic art historical comparison of two works. Um, the one on the left was painted by Claude Monet. The one on the right was painted by Auguste Renoir. They, and they were painted, you know, at the same time, uh, 186, in 1869. And the title of both of the works is called uh, Le Grenouillère, which as I understand roughly translates to the cheese wheel. <laughs> and that's what we're looking at here, this uh, little island in both of these pictures that is connected by these little planks or boardwalks, um, presumably to the shore over here on the left and then to this kind of floating cafe or restaurant on, on the right side of each canvas. And we can see in the background, uh, both of these paint paintings have swimmers in the water, they have boats further out, and of course, some boats in the foreground as well. So, um, so this is a, a, this classic comparison because we have kind of the different approaches of, of both of these artists side by side. And, um, and you can see that, that Monet is much more interested in sort of capturing the effect of light and shadow off of the water here. And Renoir is always interested in people and clothes. <laughs> so that's really the emphasis in his painting. So we get sort of a, 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 the idea that, there's the, that they have kind of the individual approaches to not only the brushwork, but even to the subject matter, but that they're still working outside and often working collaboratively like this. 
So we're going to turn our attention to, to realism and how that kind of factors in to Impressionism and the cafe culture at this point. And I absolutely love this painting that we have here. This is a self-portrait by um, the leading realist artist of mid 19th century France. His name was um, uh, Courbet. And he's a, a young man here. Uh, this was painted in 1848. And, and any young man who looks at you like this with his head tilted, tilted back and, and his eyes sort of partially closed like this, you know that there's a little bit of arrogance there, which it just comes right through in this picture. And, and Courbet um, became really famous right around 1850 because he famously said, show me an angel and I'll paint you one. He was an artist who was um, sort of devoutly committed to this idea that he will only paint the world that he sees. And this was considered completely radical for the time because you have, you know, a whole history of artists like, you know, Michelangelo going back hundreds of years who were painting religious figures, they were painting angels, they were painting cupids, and, and Courbet was the artist who said, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only going to paint the things that I see in my everyday life. So he painted things like what we see here. We have the stone breakers on the left, which is 1849. And then we have the wheat sifters from 1854 on the right. So while you have other artists who are painting, you know, dramatic historical scenes or dramatic religious scenes, what is Courbet taking up? He's taking up images of poor people who are working, um, slaving, uh, uh, working themselves uh, in, in really painful kind of backbreaking poses. Uh, I, I just, I'm always struck by this image of the stone breakers and just thinking about how, how difficult that work is. And then I notice, you know, the holes in their clothing and, and the sort of tattered edges of their clothing. And I just, I, I'm, I'm reminded of how difficult the, their lives are and how really before Courbet, there weren't artists who were documenting this or recording this in, in, in any way. And Courbet had such an influence on, on what the Impressionists were doing. One last image from Courbet, just to show you, it wasn't all about work for him, <laughs> but, um, but there, there is this massive canvas that he painted called a burial at Ornan. It dates to 1849-1850. If you've ever been to the Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris, you probably remember encountering this because it is, it's overwhelming in terms of its scale. And, um, and it had sort of, it brought about sort of a, an explosive reaction from the people of Paris when it was first exhibited because it was essentially so boring and so ugly. <laughs> um, and, and of course, the subject matter here is just that. It's death, it's a funeral, it's a, it's a small town filled with um, people who look like real people. So you have the casket being brought in here on the left, you have um, the, um, the, the uh, people of the church just in front of them. We have the, the men and women sort of segregated in the scene. You'll notice that most of the women have turned their heads away from the graves. Even the dog down front has turned his head away. And then we as the viewer would be standing right here, right in front of the hole in the ground, sort of forced to contemplate our own mortality. But again, this was not something that was considered worthy of the giant canvas that it was painted on. This was, um, this was considered um, almost an affront because it wasn't, it didn't have um, the ambitions of being beautiful and it didn't have the ambitions of really teaching a, a great lesson here. So we're going to take this sort of darker moment with Courbet <laughs> and switch gears for a moment to this idea of cafes because this is where the, the, um, the French Impressionist artists sort of, sort of um, take hold of, of Courbet's ideas, but then translate it into something that really resonates with them. So if you personally have ever been to, to Paris or in and around Paris, you have no doubt seen cafes like the one on the left here, which is one of the most famous, Le Dumago. And, um, and so the cafe culture in, in Paris is just, it's, um, it's part of visiting Paris. They, they are indoor, outdoor venues, and the intention is that you sit and you people watch and you converse and you have drinks. I hope all of you have a, have a 
glass of French wine in, in your hand right now as you're, as you're enjoying this. Um, and for our purposes this, this evening, I'm, I'm using a very large umbrella to think uh, about cafe culture because um, because it's sort of it's sort of along a continuum. So you have a place like Le Du Mago where um, where you might go and get a get a, a cafe, a coffee, and and sit for hours or or a glass of wine. But then you had um, rowdier places like the the Moulin Rouge, which was um, a place where you could get drinks, but there would also be performances. So there was this idea of, of a cafe concert, which was um, a little bit um, almost like a a precursor almost to minstrelsy in the United States. They were a little bit bawdy, they were um, a little bit risque, maybe a little bit sexual, um, but there were performances, there was drinking, and there was um, a great deal of interaction with the crowd. So, so we have this as the reality and the realism that, um, that impressionist artists are interested in. So I wanted to give you a sense in terms of of how this kind of starts to translate with Impressionist artists. So one of my favorite Impressionists, and he's sort of considered sort of like a proto-Impressionist, is um, Edward Manet. And um, Manet with an A instead of Monet. <laughs> and this is his image, um, Music in the Tuileries. So this isn't specifically a cafe per se, but we're casting a very wide net for our cafe. This is from 1862, so it's just about a decade or so after sort of the rise of Courbet and realism. And we have um, Manet sort of taking up that mantle of Courbet and thinking about, I, I'm just going to paint what I see. But instead of painting sort of the dreariness of people at a funeral or breaking stones, doing backbreaking labor, um, Manet gives us pleasure. He gives us leisure. And that's not to say that it's not fraught with all sorts of strange elements here. Um, the way Manet painted was very strange. You can see that there's just these kind of ambiguous gray blobs right here at the center of this picture. Um, some things that are painted and highly modeled and some things that just seem so blurry and so simplistic by comparison. But like I said, he's sort of a proto um, a, a proto-impressionist, so, so some of his brushstrokes are visible and some of them just look clunky. <laughs> it looks like he's aiming for realism, but he's, he's um, only achieved a little bit of a clunkiness. But this was, um, as far as I understand, really intentional when it comes to Manet. He refines his style over time. And then you have something like this. This is just such a gorgeous painting. This is from almost a little over a decade later. This is 1874. This is just called um, Boating. And a gorgeous painting like this is in an amazing collection. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So again, we have this idea that, um, that the Impressionists have seized on, on realism, but they want to anchor it in, um, in, in the idea of, of pleasure and, and you know, being out and about in Paris and, and the sights and sounds that you would see as, as a Parisian. So let's transition and think about this idea of the flaneur and how it all relates to cafe culture and being out and about in Paris. Um, this might be just a good place to pause for a moment and I'm just going to look at the, the chats that we see here. Um, is, any questions at this point if anybody wants to unmute themselves? Okay, all right, we'll keep going. So, so the term flaneur here, it's, um, <laughs> it was generally used to refer to someone who's kind of like lazy or a loafer or somebody who is just kind of milling about, but Charles Baudelaire used it specifically to identify it um, sort of a male observer of modern urban life. And you think about this, this is kind of coded with, um, so we've got gender and we've sort of got a class element to it here too. So all of a sudden we have this idea of a man who's not so busy that he can't just kind of stop and take in the sights and the sounds. Um, this is a man who is obviously not of the same class as like Corb Corbet's stone breakers. This is a man who's got like a nice overcoat and a nice um, top hat. You can almost always identify them in these paintings. And, and it's really about um, 
the power of their observations of the world. And so the artist that I have up on the screen here is named Gustav Kayabat. And this is his Man at the Window from 1876. Gustav Kayabat is oftentimes lumped in with the Impressionists. His work is very similar. He's painting at the same time. Um, but for the most part, we don't see that same kind of, of sketchiness, the, the broken brushwork. But, but what I love here is that he gives us um, this man from behind. We can almost assume um, his vision of the world as the, as the viewer of this, pic of this picture. We assume his identity, his perspective taking. And he's gazing out at you know, the wide boulevards of Paris at this time. Um, just to give you a sense in terms of what a flaneur might have looked like in real life, we've got a pho photograph, some photographic documentation here. And um, a contemporary account um, referred to a flaneur in, in this way. So of course, I'm, I'm referring here to the man in the overcoat with the, with the top hat, who just seems to be standing. He, everybody else kind of looks like they're busy crossing the street here, and he looks like he's kind of set back and taking it all in. So a contemporary count of a flaneur is um, the kind of man that is a, a mobile and passionate daguerreotype who retains the faintest traces of things and in whom is reproduced with their changing reflections, the flow of events, the city's movement, the multiple physiognomy of the public mind, the beliefs, the antipathies, and the admirations of the crowd. So I love the idea of referring to him as a, dig, uh, as a daguerreotype, something that takes a little while to set in, um, something that has this kind of ghost-like presence in some ways, but that he's, he's um, assuming and, and, um, and absorbing all of these different elements of the city uh, by, by just observation and the power that comes with that observation. So here's another image by Gustav Kayabat. Now we have a young man at the window, 1875. Again, we the viewer are invited to sort of take this perspective to have the same sense of power of being up a story or two and looking down at the world. Um, there is a sense of power and domination in that perspective. And when you zoom in, on this image, we see what he's looking at. <laughs> he's checking out this woman who is walking down the road here. <laughs> so, so we have to sort of keep in mind that, um, that as we're thinking about the French flaneur, there is this idea of the, the um, or an implied idea with a lot of these pictures of the, um, the sexual politics at the time, that, that men of a certain class had the liberty to sort of walk about and gaze at people <laughs> and women then became objects and oftentimes sexual objects of, of their gaze. So that is built into a lot of these, um, these French Impressionist paintings of, of city life and cafes. Just a few more images from Kayabat that I wanted to share. Um, the one on the left is, um, is sort of the same kind of thinking. It's this idea of being up on a balcony and, and kind of looking down. And again, there is an incredible sense of power when you look down on a crowd like this. And then on the right, another balcony scene, um, two figures looking at the Boulevard Haussmann from 1880. Um, so we see that this is a recurring theme here too, this idea of, of men sort of taking in the sights and sounds of the city, men of leisure. And then of course, if you're a, an, a fan of Impressionism, you've, you've no doubt seen this beautiful image on the left that's in the collection of the Chicago Art Institute. It's just called Paris Street, Rainy Day, 1877. And then what I always sort of think of as sort of like a sister painting to it is called Le Pont de l'Europe, which is at the, the Petit Palais in, in Paris. And it's the same idea. <clears throat> it's couples who are out strolling, figures who are out strolling on these wide boulevards to, um, to get from point A to point B, but there is this kind of emphasis on, on looking. <laughs> and in this case, you almost have um, both the, the, the primary figures here, the, male, uh, the man and the woman engaged in this kind of looking. Um, the figure on the bridge over here on the right is engaged in looking, and we can't even tell if this man sort of further back is, um, is, is accompanying this woman who seems several steps behind him, or if he is just yet another one of these flaneurs who's out and about um, taking in the views of the city. So we've, we've looked at Monet a little bit already, but I wanted to share this image because for the most part, 
Monet really was a dedicated landscape painter and he wasn't necessarily interested in um, cafes or, or cafe concerts or sort of wild nightlife of Paris. But what we do have in this image, it's always sort of haunted me. Um, there's a very straight reading of this image. This is the, the woman depicted here is um, his future wife. Her father was very sick, maybe had recently passed away. And the man um, on the right is her neighbor and he has um, come to sort of uh, pay his respects. And they're sitting in, in a garden that, that the future Madame Monet um, so loved. But when you look at this within the, with, the, with an understanding of the flaneur, it really changes the dynamics between these two figures. Whenever I look at this picture, I, I find it haunting because she looks very uncomfortable by his presence. She's leaning forward. She even almost has like an exasperated, come help me kind of look on her face or like, you know, this guy again. And he just seems um, incredibly comfortable, incredibly entitled to sort of invade her space. Um, so of course he's looking at her and, and she becomes the object in his eyes. So that's probably reading way more into this picture than, than Monet intended, but there were these kind of dynamics at play in Paris at this time. So let's shift our attention to um, Monet's good friend, Auguste Renoir, because he, out of, um, out of all the Impressionist artists, was really interested in painting people and he was really interested in painting beautiful people and beautiful clothes, and I think that's why he um, he has earned this reputation as one of the one of the most beloved French Impressionist artists out there. This is his painting um, called Umbrellas from the 1880s. This is at the National Gallery in London, and um, and I think when you first see this picture, of course, it's a it's chaos, right? It's all these different umbrellas. It's another rainy day in Paris. Um, we have these three kind of highly detailed women um, on the right in the foreground, uh, or with, uh, a woman and two children. One of them is looking right out at us. And it's really easy to sort of land on them visually and connect with them visually. But for me, I always go over to this young man on the left and his face and what is he looking at? Because I, I always look for the flanner <laughs> and this is our flanner in this picture. And I think he's sort of interested in this other woman in the foreground who, um, who doesn't, who isn't as, who isn't dressed as nicely and maybe is more of a working class um, kind of woman, still equally beautiful. And again, almost like Madame Monet, she's looking out at us, connecting with us, but doesn't necessarily seem to um, enjoy being looked at here. There's, there's uh, no doubt um, sort of a, a contemporary reading here, not a sense of distress, but, but certainly um, not a sense of, of, of pleasure and being gazed at. And so we see these all sorts of interesting um, kind of politics of, of looking and being looked at. And, and we get a sort of an interesting sense of these young women who are out in Paris and who are just kind of vulnerable. This is a, a very sketchy painting that Renoir did that's called um, La Place de Cliché, which is from 1880. And I won't spend too much time on this, but again, it's, it, it, it's always reminded me of the umbrellas in that we have um, the, this lovely young lady in the foreground who is um, who has around her all of these men in top hats who could easily be flanners and I always get this sense of almost slight distress like there's an urgency in crossing the street here and sort of getting away. Renoir does give us cafe culture so let's dive into cafes too. Um, and he gives us people who are out and about um, living it up in Paris in the 1870s and the 1880s. And so this is a picture that's just called The Cafe. It's from 1874. And what we have here are two lovely young ladies, um, almost right at the center, who are sharing this small table. And, um, and it looks as though this um, gentleman has approached them and he sort of has his hands on that same table. They seem interested in him. They seem like they're talking to him. But we also have the observer of modern life, the flaneur, just directly behind them, 
who doesn't seem like he is a part of their group, a part of uh, accompanying them, but he seems as though he's as engaged in this conversation as they are. And he's sort of entertained by it, sort of this aloof, detached entertainment. And I think those two concepts are really important when it comes to a planner as well. So if you're a young woman out in the city, really if you're anybody out in the city, people are going to be watching you, um, but you are uh, um, particularly an object of interest if you're a young, beautiful woman. Renoir, uh, as an artist, was out and about himself. And so he painted people in cafes and going to shows. And so this is another uh, famous work by, by Renoir. This is called La Loge. So this is in, in essentially a box at the, at the uh, Paris Opera. And this is from 1874. So again, we have a gorgeous woman who's all done up like a China doll here. <laughs> she's got um, this sort of white face powder on, her hair's done up, she's got roses in her hair, roses um, at, her, uh, um, uh, at, at, at her dress, at her neckline, um, it, an impossible number of pearls here, there's gold jewelry, and yet the man who is accompanying her is engaged in the act of looking at someone else. Um, he's got his opera glasses to his eyes and he's looking up. And of course, there's no way <laughs> that the stage is up from where they're sitting. They're, they're up in a balcony. So he is looking at, at, at other um, opera attendees in this case. So um, again, this is, this is sort of a classic art historical example of the power of the male gaze and, and, um, and how that sort of um, relegates a woman to um, this position of being a, a, essentially a mere object. So just a few other images that kind of by Renoir that sort of speak to these, these kind of um, gender politics at the time. Uh, these are um, young people who are uh, just leaving the conservatory. That's the name of this painting. It's from 1877. It's at the Barnes Foundation down in Philadelphia. It's, again, such a fascinating picture in terms of this idea of the flaneur. Um, but our flaneurs here are not just observers of modern life. They are young men who have decided to approach these young women. And, um, and, and I think you can read so much into the body language here. Uh, the, the women look as though they're kind of pressed up against this wall or this column. Um, one of them has linked her arms around her, around her friends, or linked her hands around her friend's arms. Uh, one of them has rolled up their program and sort of holds it in front of them in this kind of protective way. And then if you look at the men, <laughs> one man has his arm on his friend's back as though pushing him forward. So th there's um, everything about this encounter seems sort of charged by, um, by these gender politics at the time. And, um, and it, it's so interesting that, that Renoir has had the sensitivity to capture these moments because of course, what Renoir is best known for um, are these really sort of jubilant scenes of people coming together um, in outdoor cafes or in outdoor sort of clubs like the one that we see here, which is called the Moulin de la Galette. Um, this is from 1876. And, um, and this is at the Musée d'Orsay. This is a larger work than you know, the standards kind of smaller impressionist work. And I think for the most part, this, this work just makes people so happy. <laughs> There's just something so lovely about it. And I think, um, I think in the age of, of COVID, like our hearts ache for, for days like this when we could all gather together and, and people can, can dance and drink and socialize um, and people of all ages and, um, and, and have that, that sense of community here too. So, so we definitely get the, the same kind of gender politics that we've seen with, with a lot of Renoir's work, but here we, we've got that kind of cafe element that goes along with it too. So these young men sitting here enjoying some wine and interacting with the, with the young women over here as well. And, and I think in, the, in a work like this, you really see uh, that kind of full-blown impressionist style. One of the elements that I always go to in this picture is how... Um, this gentleman here who we see from behind, uh, how his whole head and his back is just kind of sun dappled. You get the sense of uh, the sunlight coming through the trees all around them. And then you notice that figures throughout the picture have this kind of sun dappled 
um, look to them. And of course, there's all this kind of loose, broken brushwork. Um, but at this point, it seems sort of virtuoso as compared to Manet's kind of clunky <laughs> approach to it um, just about a decade earlier. So, um, so there's this liveliness, there's this festive element to it that we don't really see with, you know, a landscape by, by Monet or a, or a haystack. And this is, I think, why people love Renoir so much. Um, also, you have the luncheon at the boating party, which is from 1881, probably his best work ever. <laughs> this is at the Phillips Collection down in DC. And so you can see that this kind of, uh, lively bo uh, boisterous group has just kind of sailed in down the Seine and has come into um, this little restaurant or cafe to dine and drink together to engage to socialize and even though we have these very prominent sort of um, boaters in the front we do have our sort of classic flaneurs who are, are, are dotting this group as well so um so with a picture like this, where we have, um, again, sort of women and men interacting in really interesting ways, um, you know, there's, there's all these men who are sort of like leaning into these conversations with women. I've always loved this woman over here on, on the right who seems almost shocked by what she's being told or what she's hearing here. Um, and we have this kind of luscious still life of, of the wine and the fruit in, in, the, in the center here. So it's, um, it's all that liveliness. It's all those kind of gendered politics that come into play and an artist like Renoir uh, were free to kind of move about and to kind of and I mean they were friends with a lot of these people and related to a lot of these people so they um, they were just sort of uh, became an expert at capturing these moments and I want to contrast that really briefly with um, with the way a female artist was approaching um, uh, her subjects around the same time. So you have somebody like um, Mary Cassatt, who is, um, was an, an American expatriate. She was living in Paris. She was uh, certainly considered one of the impressionist artists. And of course, you look at something like this and you can see that um, that gorgeous kind of broken brushwork, the visible brush strokes here along the golden frame of the mirror up here, e even in the silverware or, or in the silver uh, tea set here um, and on and on the furniture as well. But when we look at something by Mary Cassatt, because she was a woman and because she was sort of an upper class woman, um, she was not out at the cafe. She was not out at the bars. And, um, and instead we have this, this view of kind of a constrained life, um, a life that's relegated to the domestic sphere. And just a few more images by Mary Cassatt really sort of underscore that idea. Her works are always known for, um, uh, kind of being relegated to, uh, to, to the home, relegated to these really kind of simple tasks like reading or hugging children. <laughs> and that really um, stands out in comparison, stark contrast with what her good friend, um, the artist Edgar Degas was doing. Now Degas sort of came from the same social class and this is a picture called the Song Rehearsal from 1873. This is at Dumbarton Oaks. And we can see that, you know, women of this social class, maybe they, they did perform and sing, but they would do this um, within the safety and within the confines of their own homes. This is, I believe, uh, Degas' own sister who's performing here. But what Degas becomes most famous for, most well known for, is, um, is going out in Paris and documenting what he saw in the cafes. And, um, and a lot of these images are, are sort of similar, but I wanted to show you a, a good number of them because they're really fun. <laughs> and you get the, the sense that Degas as an artist was having a lot of fun going out and being out amongst these people. So he oftentimes shows us female performers. Degas was very well known for um, painting um, a lot of images of ballet dancers. And you can sort of think of this as like the seedier side of, of painting performances. The performances um, at these cafe concerts, again, were not as elegant or as refined as a ballet or something that you might see at a Paris opera. They were, there was singing, there was probably some dancing, there was a lot of joking, and there was a lot of sexuality to it. So oftentimes what you see in the foreground of uh, Degas' images are um, 
women, men who don't necessarily fit sort of a cl uh, classical definition of beauty, there's always kind of a coarseness to them, a grotesqueness to them. And then Degas always loves to throw in the band or the, the orchestra in the middle here, um, which is accentuated by this like large scroll from uh, a big bass-like instrument. So we have the, the, the performers at night who seem like they're really kind of engaged with the crowd here. So we'll go through some of these images a little bit quicker. Um, uh, again, more performers sort of elegantly dressed, but also, you know, with, with sort of deep necklines here, some of them with flowers in their hair, and again, some of them leaning over, engaging with the audience or engaging with, with the musicians. And again, that's that large scroll work from, um, from the, the musical instruments kind of serving as a punctuation mark in this, in this uh, particular image. Some, a lot of uh, Degas' work that I'm showing you right now are pastels as opposed to um, oil paintings. This is one of my absolute favorites by Degas. It's called Cafe Concert Song of the Dog. So this was a woman who had her, um, she was, uh, I, I believe, a, a pretty famous performer who had this one routine. And you can see just by the way her hands are sort of dotting here, or her hands are sort of um, limp in front of her, you can see that she's kind of acting something out. There's this kind of garish light on her from below. Um, and, and again, she's not kind of classically beautiful. There's, um, there's a coarseness to her. Sometimes Degas would often use these redheads to um, indicate um, almost like a, a, a working class woman. So we really get the sense of kind of a seedier performance taking place at night. And this is someplace that um, our friend Mary Cassatt would never set foot in. <laughs> Another sort of uh, elaborate or gesture from a performer up on stage with, um, with the audience just here in the foreground. Uh, you, can, you can tell that Degas spent a lot of time at these venues. <laughs> this is a great image. It's called Singer with a Glove from 1878. This is at the Fog Museum. I think I hold this image in my mind as like the classic pose of somebody who's really belting out a tune. Um, but again, we have this woman who is lit from below and it's not doing her any favors in this case. Uh, it's a really dramatic scene with that, with the black glove on her hand and then um, all these, the, the, the stripes of color behind her um, that are part of, the, part of the stage. So we've got, a, again, this kind of dramatic performance that's taking place, but you don't get the sense that it's necessarily something that it's, um, that it's fine art or high art, that, is, that there's this sort of seediness to it. And so Descartes gives us images like this one too, where the performance is sort of relegated to the background. And we see um, just up in the top right, the performer on stage um, in yellow, and maybe the show has just ended or maybe it's about to end. But what, what Descartes is telling us about here is all of the figures who are sort of pausing and interacting with each other, particularly this man right at the center who looks like he's leaning over talking to another redheaded woman. Again, not someone who's classically beautiful, but we get the sense of the type of people that attend these, these performances and, and how these performances are an opportunity for them to make connections with each other as well. Um, again, more of these women that that um, that Dega, uh captured uh, uh, on the streets or near the streets or near these cafe concerts um, in Paris in the 1870s and in the 1880s. This one's just called "Women on a Cafe Terrace," and these poor women, again, these a lot of these redheaded women with these kind of exaggerated costumes, these kind of coarse faces. Um, and all of this, this kind of loose, in this case, it's not brushwork, it's pastels again, but um, kind of the looseness of, of, a, of an Impressionist uh, painting. And, and we see here, uh, again, this, uh, this kind of seedier, kind of underbelly of, of Parisian life that, um, that, uh, that artists who were just kind of starting off with Impressionism were so interested in capturing. And this, I would say, is the ultimate depiction in our, in the and one of the last ones that we'll see from Dega, which is called The Absinthe or The Absinthe Drinkers. And of course, if you're familiar with the history at this time, um, these artists were really interested in capturing 
or um, well, interested in capturing what was happening at the cafes and what, and what was happening at the cafes was a real um, interest in this one beverage in particular called absinthe, which um, was said to have hallucinogenic properties and was later blamed for several murders and then, um, and then banned outright. But a lot of absinthe drinkers tended to go into sort of a drunken stupor, which is what we see here with this woman. So instead of the rowdiness of a cafe concert, we sort of get like the emptiness and the loneliness of somebody who is probably pretty much blackout drunk. Um, Degas would give us this sense of loneliness to here too. We've got another redhead woman in, um, in this sort of elaborate costume sitting by herself in a cafe from 1877. It's not very clear to me if she's playing solitaire or if she's looking at tarot cards, but she's engaged in an activity that, um, that sort of keeps her active, keeps her occupied as she's sitting here by herself, but she's certainly interested in what's going on around her. And one last image by Degas is, um, is this one here, one of my favorites of all time, where we see two women, um, one of them who looks like they're sort of emotionally in pain, the other one who looks like they're, they're concerned about their friend. Look at how wild the, um, the, the, um, the color application is, particularly in the background here. The, everything is loose. Everything is really sort of um, visible and broken in terms of, of the application of color here. Um, but we have this real sense of intimacy, even in a public space. I think these chairs sort of indicate to me that they are out in public. It is called at the cafe, and this stands in such stark contrast to um, what upper class women were painting at the time when we go back to Mary Cassatt. So we're going to turn our attention and sort of wind up with, um, with Manet who was another great, um, like I said, sort of a proto-impressionist painter, but um, another great one for documenting cafe scenes. Um, and, and, the, and these cafe scenes continue to be these incredible little slices of life um, of what Paris was like in the 1870s and 1880s. So we have this beautiful young woman here. This is called The Plum. It's from 1878. And this is at the National Gallery of Art um, down in DC gorgeous colors here. Um, and this woman who looks a little bored, maybe a little bit lonely, sitting at a cafe table, a cigarette in her hand. I, I don't think the, uh, she has that, that same coarseness that we see with a lot of Degas pictures, but, um, but she has that same sort of sense of, of being out in public, but being sort of disconnected from, um, from all that happens in these cafes. It's sort of like a, an early Ed, Edward Hopper, forecasting Edward Hopper. But for the most part, Manet's scenes tend to be really sort of chaotic and boisterous and sort of speak to that, that sense of being alone in a crowd, or they often do. Uh, we have this couple in the foreground here at this cafe, maybe a performer up in the top left. I always think that this is probably a server, like a barmaid who's actually engaged in drinking herself here. But we have the couple in the foreground who are sitting seemingly at a bar or at a table almost as though we're sitting across from them. And there's such an emotional or psychological disconnect from both of them. They're not drinking absinthe. We don't get the sense that they're blackout drunk like our, our um, figures from Jaka, but there is a sense of, of loneliness, isolation, and drunkenness here, even despite all of the energy that you get from everything else that many has included in this picture. And you see sort of the same thing here. At your eye in this picture, um, which is called at the cafe from 1878. I think my eye always goes to this sort of happy looking woman who's in the foreground. She's got a companion here, but then this woman who's just beyond them, um, her profile and her expression always slightly terrifies me. She seems um, sort of achingly alone. She seems sort of desperate. So we have uh, this sort of jumble of 
humanity. We have this um, really sort of interesting sort of chaos of all these people kind of pushed together, experiencing different things in this tight space. Um, we see sort of similar things happening here again, Manet's uh, Corner at the Cafe Concert from 1878. And I love the way this one is painted. It has like much more uh, buttery brush strokes here. Again, the emphasis on the drinking, <laughs> um, their performances that might take place. Um, everybody's kind of looking in different directions. Uh, I love that um, that the figures up on stage are not uh, the main attraction, that certainly the woman who is the server here seems like she's occupied with something else <laughs> that has taken her attention. And then Manet's sort of latest or one of his last and greatest works is, um, is called The Bar at the Folie Bergère, which again is, um, is a huge, it was a huge performing venue um, that wasn't necessarily a cafe, but sort of akin to them. And of course the bar there is kind of related to it. And this is a late painting for um, Manet. This was 1882. And if you're ever in, uh, in London, you can see it at the Courtauld Institute. And so what we're looking at here is this beautiful young woman who is um, tending the bar at, um, at this huge theater venue, which we can sort of see um, behind her. And you get a sense of the venue itself and the kind of performances that are there because of these little green feet that are coming in from the top left in this picture, um, a trapeze artist. And, um, and with this picture, I, you're always drawn in by, by this beautiful young server, but the, the sort of emptiness in her gaze. Again, she sort of presented as this beautiful object, sort of the same way that Renoir painted um, the young woman at, at the opera. And we see what we think is um, her mirror reflection, and then this kind of flanner type who is approaching her, presumably to ask for a drink, but also maybe to just approach her. And so, um, so we think that this is a mirror because of that golden frame um, that's just behind her. So everything that we see kind of behind her in the picture would actually be a reflection of what she's looking at here. And so there is the, the oddity here that her reflection, if that is what this is, doesn't really match up the way um, a, an actual mirror reflection would work here. And she certainly seems maybe a little bit more engaged in her reflection. So she's presented as this elegant still life object, sort of like the other objects here on the bar. Um, and we, the viewer, sort of assume that role of the flaneur again. So, um, so because this is such a strange and sort of fun and complicated image, I just wanted to quickly show you how um, one of the sketches that that Manet did for this picture, just kind of working through this idea of a mirror and a man approaching a beautiful woman here. So, um, so we can sort of see an earlier version and, and how this picture eventually came together. I always find that fascinating. So just to sort of start wrapping up, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of show you where these Impressionist artists then went on. So they kind of got their start with realism. They kind of got their start with going out to the cafes, to the shows, um, capturing you know, life on the streets of Paris. So where do you go from there? Well, art, the, well the artist Edgar Degas, um, after a, about, um, I would say beginning in the 18, 90s and, and later on, we see a real sort of turn away from the um, Paris nightlife and we see a real dedication to wanting to paint and capture the female body. So that's when we see a real interest in the, the ballet dancers and then just in nudes. He painted and, and sketched a lot of women bathing, but he would always try to, or he always seemed to capture them in sort of awkward moments and strange ungainly poses. So even this one on the right, you can think about you know, an artist trying to, to trying to paint you nude or, or uh, do a pastel of you nude, and he's asking you to just have your shirt halfway off the top of your head. I always think it's a good thing to to try and almost imagine striking the pose that that Degas asked of his subjects. Um, we know that Monet was never really one for documenting everyday life, but we do know that later on in his in his career, particularly into the 20th century, it's devoid of human life. It is just about the water lilies. That's what he was focusing on. So these two works are from um, 1916 on the right, 
or sorry, on the left, and then 1919 on the right. And then uh, artists like Renoir, who is painting these beautiful people, you know, boating parties and, and at cafes and what have you, those kind of gender politics on the streets of Paris, he abandons that as well. And he becomes interested, um, not solely interested, but pretty interested in just painting monumental female nudes, these kind of um, large bodies focusing on, on, these, on the female form sort of similar to Degas. So these two pictures are also at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And the one on the left dates to eight, uh, 1910, and the one on the right is to uh, 1918. So it's a, sort of amazing that these artists continued on in their career for so many more decades, but they were all kind of trying to find some way to make Impressionism a little bit more permanent or to um, take you know what seemed like so, um, sketchy, loose, and free, and to to add a little bit of structure to it, and to add their own um, their own perspective and their own interest to it. So we'll wrap up thinking about the next generation of artists to come along, and how they really seized on the cafe culture and cafe concerts in Paris too. So you have the impressionists, and then the post impressionists artists like this one, Toulouse Lautrec painted at the Moulin Rouge from um, 1892. This is at the Art Institute of Chicago. And, um, and a lot of these post-impressionist artists, they're not painting necessarily the leisure and the fun that Degas might have captured or that Renoir captured. Um, and is oftentimes they're painting scenes that are slightly alarming. I mean, this woman with the green face staring out at us in this picture, always slightly terrifies me. This is this is what you would call the limelight. That's that's the effect that's on her face right there. So she's probably sitting right by a stage. Um, but all of these figures, again, sort of have this kind of coarseness, kind of this garishness that we saw kind of bubbling up with, with Degas, but then somebody like Toulouse-Lautrec takes it to um, an extreme. So before Degas gives us a little bit of uplighting and Toulouse-Lautrec turns it into the green limelight and, and this kind of alien-like figure. Um, a few more images by Toulouse-Lautrec. He was always um, creating posters for, for shows and cafe concerts, um, La Galou and Jean Avril. So we have the sense of the, of the performances, but you can see even with the Jean Avril poster over here on the right, um, in the 1890s, uh, to, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec is still borrowing from Degas and using the, the, um, the orchestra uh, instruments as kind of a, an interesting punctuation to the stage shows that, um, that Degas had painted decades before. And the last post-impressionist artist that I wanted to show you who would sometimes uh, show us scenes of, of nightlife <laughs> uh, is, uh, is Van Gogh. And this is his painting, Night Cafe, from 1888. This is at the, the Yale University Art Museum, um, a rare, really incredible Van Gogh that we have here in the United States. And of course, the feeling here is, I think, really akin to what um, Toulouse-Lautrec gave us, where the sense here is this, there's a foreignness, there's an alienness, there's, um, there's a sense of danger or impending <laughs> doom in, in a cafe like this one. Um, you can imagine that all of these figures who are huddled over their drinks were drinking absinthe or, or are in a drunken stupor. We noticed that the clock here, it's after midnight. My mom would always say nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> and we as the, um, we, we as the viewer feel like we're being stared at by this figure from across the room. Um, and Van Gogh talks specifically about the colors that he used in this picture and that the color combination of these yellows and oranges and the greens um, were jarring colors that, that, that were supposed to produce a disturbing effect in the viewer. Um, and he talked about this as a place that would drive someone mad or make them want to commit a murder. So, so we've lost that sort of sense of wonder and freedom that we saw um, with those with the light impressionist works of the 18th or 70s and the 1880s. Um, I think 
uh, we as viewers sort of love to think about works by, by Renoir because they capture this kind of innocence and, the, um, and that's echoed in the way these paintings are even executed. And we see that later on in the next generation, um, there's, a, there's sort of a, a darker quality, oftentimes a darker quality to them. So I know I've gone a little bit over in terms of our time, but, um, but I think we'll wrap up here and I welcome any questions that anybody has or any comments, um, anything that, that um, looking at these works has maybe prompted in you or questions or, or, um, or new ideas. So please feel free to unmute yourself and jump in the conversation. Covered a lot here tonight, <laughs> so um, a lot to take in. We saw a lot of images. Um, I appreciate everybody sort of staying on, staying on with me through all of this, and I hope um, I hope seeing these images together together gives you a, a new sense or a new appreciation for those kind of gender politics that were at play, um, and how um, how important this element of impressionism was to the bigger picture to, um, because I think, again, so many of us are thinking impressionism, it's the water lilies, it's these outdoor pictures. And, and I think that there's a lot more going on than, than I think most of us realize when we just think of impressionism in general. Uh, Jane, there is some stuff on chat. I don't know if you've seen that, Great. some questions. I do see that Karen has raised her hand, and I'm sorry, I'm not experienced enough with um, with Zoom to, to know how to call on you in any other way. <laughs> I think um, I just needed to unmute myself. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. I'm sitting in a field in Virginia, so <laughs> hard to tell. Um, I can't even get stuff down at my house, so I have to come sit in this field on the farm. A few years ago, um, I read Susan Vreeland's book, The Luncheon of the Boating Party. Have you ever read that? I, I, I was, no, no, tell, tell us about it. I, I love her. She um, writes a lot okay. about the artistic process, and, and it's supposed to be about kind of how Renoir created this and the stress that he went through trying to get his friends and whatever that I, I think he was at, at that point needed money desperately and he he really wanted and I don't I guess my question is if you haven't read it and and maybe at the time that I read it I wasn't sure if I read enough detail in it um, whether it's true or you know a fictionalized account mm -hmm. but um, it's a wonderful I love all of her books and she tends to talk about the artistic process and and to me I mean, I draw a little bit, but I'm not an artist. To me, it seems real. Um, and I was so thrilled with it that then I had to drive up to DC and go to the Phillips collection and see the painting. And it, and it was well worth the trip. I mean, just well worth the trip. But um, I didn't know if you have ever heard of her or um, what you think about that possibility of someone, you know, writing about the artistic process and um, it, it's a really fascinating read. I, I wish I knew if it was how much of it, you know, I'm sure she did research. Yeah. Oh, well, now I feel like I'm going to have to look her up and look up that book. That sounds really interesting. And I think even, even if it is a fictionalized account, I think it's, a, there's so much value in, in us as viewers sort of delving in and really thinking about what that process really is because and I, and I think there is a process because as impressionism went along it wasn't just something that you dashed off um, in a, a painting that you just dashed off in the middle of an afternoon when you look at something like luncheon at, at the boating party I mean it's a really complicated image and it's certainly something that would have required a lot of planning <laughs> and and a lot uh, I would imagine a lot of preparatory works um, particularly uh, one element of this that has uh, been pointed out to me and, and it's always sort of stayed with me is kind of the push and pull that happens throughout throughout this canvas um, 
figures leaning backwards, figures leaning in. It's even echoed in, you know, the um, the the edge of the awning here, and and the the reeds that are just out uh, outside of the barrier, uh, uh, outside of the banister here. So there's this incredible kind of play of movement here that that uh, I think really makes this particular picture feel very alive. And I don't think that happens um, by accident. And so I can imagine that really sort of delving into the process in this picture um, or with this picture would be a, a really sort of fascinating read, whether or not it, it, it's, it's fiction or nonfiction. I, thank you for sharing the book title with I us. Think, I know. think some of it is factual because he talks about um, trying to bring people in that are from different classes and like some of the people in here are the owners of the cafe who were his friends and then some of them are more society people and i think i just was reading that that part of it is true that you know he tried to portray that and that you know the classes were mixing more than they had been especially with the artist yeah. so um thank you i loved this this was fascinating thank you so much thank you for your comment thank you for joining us I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I was wondering uh, how the artist captured the images of the night performances, of, like Degas, um, the singer with the black glove. I mean, were they standing there at the performance sketching with their color pastels? Um, and the ones that turned ended up being oil paintings, how did they capture the image to go back and paint it? Yeah, that, what a great question. And I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. And I don't, I don't know for sure exactly what Degas process was, but I think because these were night scenes, we, we don't get the sense that he was out there like uh, Renoir and Mo with his tiny little canvas. And, and um, he was, I, I have no doubt that he was sketching when he, when he was out and about, but I think that he had the liberty to go back and rework ideas or, or refine ideas back in his studio. That is such a great thing to bring up because, because it's nighttime. <laughs> and right. <laughs> That's a different uh, medium here. So, so thank you for, for pointing that out. But that, that's something I'd have to look a little bit more in depth at. And it would be fascinating to know, you know, how many of these people were actually modeling for him, how many, uh, how many of these images were more spontaneous. Right. Thank you. Nobody else? Then I'll ask one more question. <laughs> um, I, I always thought that Mary Cassatt's uh, subject choice was purposely to elevate the domestic. Mm -hmm. um, but this was the first time I looked at it and thought, well, you know, I was listening to what you were saying and I was thinking, well, maybe she was just, her access to other environments was just restricted. Yeah, I, I think uh, a lady of her social standing really couldn't have gone out and done the same things that Degas was doing at that time. Um, and I, I, I love framing it as elevating this subject matter. I think that's, that's a wonderful way of thinking of it. It might be, it might be a generous way of thinking of it. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. but, but I mean, there's a sense for me in, in so many of her pictures of women who look absolutely bored. She does have a, a short series that she did, I think it was in the early 1880s, where she showed women going to the Paris Opera. And I wish I had included some of them in, in this presentation, but these women sort of take on the role of Flanner. They have um, their own opera glasses. And there's, to me, so much more energy and vitality to those pictures than to you know the women who are just kind of sitting there with the baby <laughs> over their shoulders, um, they're they're getting a little taste of the Paris nightlife, and and I think you it, it almost captures like Mary Cassatt's own excitement about being out of out and about too. So I highly recommend looking at some of those images too. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us for tonight. I hope um, you enjoyed the images and maybe um, learned to look at them in maybe a new way or appreciate them in a new way. Um, and, and I appreciate you for, for, for joining us. So have a great night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Jane. And we'll see everyone on the 20, September 29th for Edward Hopper.
Oh, that'll be great. great. Thank you. Bye.